I used to tell people I did not know I was poor mm -hmm. and recognize the fact that I grew up in the projects um, and of Youngstown, Ohio, and I was totally comfortable with how I grew up. But I didn't realize I was poor until I went to college. I went to college and I, I realized, I mean, because Big Ma and Ma, we had some joy and love in our house. Wow, wow. And, um, I swear I was in college finding out what people have, what people can do, where people go, um, going over a friend, you know, one of my um, um, college buddies, we went over his house and it's like, wow, this is a whole different space than what I grew up in, right? And um, I, I started to realize, I mean, I'm in college now, so I'm starting to realize um, there are some differences between those who have and those who have not. I'm back with another episode of So What Success Stories. And today, my guest is the extraordinary <laughs> Ed Robinson, better known as the Rainmaker. Now, Ed is a consultant, author, speaker, coach, and he is the founder owner of Robinson Performance Group. Now, I met Ed through the National Speakers Association, probably six or seven years ago, um, but I, I, I never will forget that he was one of the very kind people in the new um, National Speakers Association who embraced me as a brand new face at Influence, which is our, our national conference. Uh, Ed embraced me at that time, and he was a very, very established speaker at that time, and, um, and I have looked up to him and admired him uh, since that time. And I am just super, super honored to be speaking to you today, Ed, and for you to be sharing your wisdom with me and everybody who gets to see this video. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Summer, it is a pleasure and a joy to be part of your show. Um, yeah. I recognize, however, that you probably look at look up to me primarily because I'm 6'5". <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a start. <laughs> uh, however, that influence, we took a picture together and you made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. You made me look good. I appreciate that. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I currently live in Houston, Texas. I um, grew up in Ohio. Um, I'm originally from Youngstown, Ohio. Went to college in Canton, Ohio. Then I lived in Chicago for a good period of time as an accountant um, for a computer company, as well as like an accountant for Union Oil, Union 76 back in the day. And um, then we, I, we had our first kid. I am the proud father of three incredible boys. Um, I, I have called them various names throughout the years. I, in their younger days, I always called them Monster One, Monster Two, and Monster Three, because they took me to the edge in everything they did. Um, but but I've been blessed by having them them with me. So I went to college for at a small college called Walsh University in Canton, Ohio, and then I I shifted into business. I um I it, I'm a basketball player, so I played basketball and. I um, also majored in accounting, so I got my degree, um, started working for all, then I worked for computer companies um, until my company that I was working for got purchased, mm -hmm. and um, the headquarters moved from San Antonio, Texas, to Nice, France. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that was when it was like, no, I'm not going there. And I decided to start my own business. Oh, wow. And when was that? Year-wise, that was a long time ago. I started my own, my very first business in 1984. And that was a different business? My very first business was the accounting business. I had a CPA practice where I did tax and accounting for small and medium-sized businesses. And we service some 300, 350 businesses around San Antonio, Texas. 
Oh, wow. Okay. And so then you made the shift into the speaking business. So hopefully you'll share a little bit of that throughout the story. So I will for sure. I will for awesome. sure. Awesome. Awesome. So in this program, I have what I call the So What Success System. Okay. It is my belief that if anyone can learn how to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate choices, they can have So What Success. And that is success in spite of anything you go through in life. I've been privileged to to to, um, to meet you several years ago and get to know you on a personal and a professional level. And I know that you are a so what success man. So let's get into your story. Tell us a, yeah. a little bit about some of the obstacles you've had to overcome and just how you did it. Wow. Obstacles in life, obstacles in business or a combination thereof? Yeah, both. OK, I guess one of the, my early obstacles was the fact that um, at 17, my father died. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was pretty much raised by my mother and my grandmother um, from a very young age. Um, while my father died when I was 17, um, he was not an integral part of our family. While they were separated and they were divorced, but he was, he was not an everyday th um, part of raising me. And I'll play with that for a second because as a parent, my parents, specifically my mother and my grandmother, would always tell me that dad was sick or dad was away or dad was whatever. And he did go through some sickness. My dad had um, tuberculosis mm -hmm. and was in a TB sanitarium for a good period of time. Um, but my dad, <clears throat> my dad also was into drugs. And some of that time when they told me that he was in the hospital, he was in prison. And in that prison space, you know, we would write and go back and forth. And I remember one specific day, my mom and my grandmother went to visit him with me in the car. And I had to sit in the car throughout that visit, oh. um, thinking I was outside of a hospital. And many years later, recognizing that that was um, the outside of a prison. Wow. So, however, with that, I also had very loving guardians when, in my mother and my grandmother. And I, tell, I used to tell people this, and I used to even share it in my speeches I have in, in many moons. And um, however, your questions have, uh, have scratched that and brought that back up. And that question is obstacles. I used to tell people I did not know I was poor mm -hmm. and recognize the fact that I grew up in the projects um, and of Youngstown, Ohio, and I was totally comfortable with how I grew up, but I didn't realize I was poor until I went to college. I went to college and I, I realized, I mean, because Big Ma and Ma, we had some joy and love in our house. Wow, wow. And, um, I swear I was in college, finding out what people have, what people can do, where people go, um, going over a friend, you know, one of my um, um, college buddies, we went over his house and it's like, wow, this is a whole different space than what I grew up in, right? And um, I, I started to realize, I mean, I'm in college now, so I'm starting to realize um, there are some differences between those who have and those who have not. But one of the things that those of us who don't have material things, we have a strong sense of love. And that sense of love that I got from my grandmother and my mom, I was good to go. I mean, I, I was raised, my big mom used to say, with education, you can do and be anything you want to be. And um, she pushed that all of our lives with education. You can do and be anything that you want to be. You know um, what, Ed? I, um, I, one thing, every time you say Big Ma, it takes me back because my great grandmother, and I think, you know, a lot of people know that my grandmother, who was 100 years old now. Oh, wow. She's a hundred. She just that's a blessing. That's <laughs> awesome. Her mother, though, was Big Mom. Okay. And okay. and I and I was blessed to know my great grandmother. 
Yeah, like, awesome. yeah, and, and that was big ma and you know you said something else too so it made me think about when i went to college it was the same thing i grew up poor too i think mm-hmm. i really did know though when i was poor that i was poor <laughs> um but when i got to college it was on a whole other level because it was just like what you expressed uh-huh. saying that like p- these people go here and do this and have that even shoes it was an interesting yeah. thing for me shoes was a big thing for me because i saw sandals it was my roommate she had these sandals and i'm like gosh you got some sandals She's like yeah i'm gonna get some new boots soon i'm like you get to get new boots uh <laughs> I remember I those things those things but um but it's awesome what it did for me was provide perspective and it also gave me hope and showed me what i could do talk about some of the ways that you were able to overcome the obstacles you talked about love and that is powerful um any other things you want to add to that on how you oh. were able to deal with that, those obstacles you know, if I stayed in that space for a second, um, I got in trouble in junior high um, and started doing some um, fighting and gang and all that kind of stuff. And um, hmm. mom, big mom, weren't going to have it. So they took me in, in the seventh grade, they took me out of public schools and put me into the Catholic school system. Okay. okay. And so I went to Catholic eighth grade and catholic high school and then subsequently got a scholarship to go to a catholic university to continue my education so the fact that i have parents who who loved me and i recognize that i was the oldest grandson of our crew i mean so i was the first to go to college and i was the first to have that opportunity and when i first went i was scared to death of college. I'm serious. It's like, okay, I did good at my, my school work and I did good at, in high school. I'm in college now, right? <laughs> and uh, my first year, I was I was on it and I was studying. And keep in mind, I was a, a student athlete. So I had to play and, and study, play and study. And I was so scared. I studied all the time and got on the dean's list. Now, I didn't realize I was going to go down this path, but because I got dean's list my freshman year, I took it for granted my sophomore year. And I'm still on the team, you know, I'm still doing my, my, my basketball, but I got lazy. I, they asked me to tutor other students, tutor some of the fresh. I mean, I thought I had it going on. And I took my A, um, and I think it was English or something like that. And um, I took, got, ended up with a C minus or D in English and made the mistake of telling my mother. (laughs) Now, if she would have just held that, I would have been good to go. But no, she told Big Mom. (laughs) You had some strong women. You had some strong women. Big Mom sent me, but we used to, I'm the oldest of eight kids. And um, she sent me a love letter. She basically said that, um, Notice child, seven children here at home watching you do what you do so that they can see if they're going to do it too. She says, you do not have the option of screwing this up. You are there to study. I don't want to hear that basketball gets in the way of the education you're there. Basketball, and she put this in the letter. Basketball is just your vehicle for getting an education. Get that education so that you can leave the impression to your siblings of how important that is. Now, you have to also say, recognize, I call her Big Mom. Big Mom, and I shared early, <laughs> I shared early, I'm 6'5". So I'm 6'5". Big Ma is about five foot, half an inch. I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> and she called me up until she passed away, Little Ed. And she would say, Little Ed, I said. <laughs> and, I, and I would say, yes, ma'am, because I knew who was in charge. But then she would always, with those love letters that she would send, she would always send a little check. She may send $100 for me to play around with. And what was magical about the hundred dollars, it was always a check. And in the um, description of the check, she would put love expense. 
So that's powerful. And what I hear in there too is the power of support, a family support. So even though your father wasn't there, mm-hmm. your mother was there and she had support. And I know a lot of people watching this may struggle with that and may not have, they may not have the father support. They may not have the grandmother support. That's the whole village thing that um, is so important. When somebody is missing, somebody and the other people step up and how powerful it can be. And holding even little Ed, little big Ed <laughs> accountable. I think that's powerful. And as a single mother, um, I can definitely, definitely appreciate everything that you said and the the, the power of that support um, that your mom was able to to get and that your your grandmother being there. That's powerful. Actually, the, the magic on that is always look for someone who can support you, even if you don't have it in your family. Look for someone who, um, you even if it's a teacher or a coach or someone who. Um, can appreciate that you're trying to be better than who you are today so that they can help you through the maze of life. Because if you're the first in your family to do some things, there's not, there's not a blueprint. And you don't even know what you don't know. Oh my God, you have no idea all the stuff I didn't know as I was trying to pursue my career. Absolutely. And I, I can I echo those sentiments 100 percent in that finding finding those people to fill in the gaps. And that's definitely how I was able to get through, too. All, All right. right. So the second part of a success system is eliminating excuses. And you, you talked about that even just a little bit just then and saying finding some people. So not having certain people in your life could be an excuse. Right. But you, you know what? You're that. right. You're right. I mean, because a lot of people who don't have that are coming up with other things that they, other reasons why they can't be successful. And, and I, I personally don't buy in it. Um, and in my older years, it's been the, become even less of an excuse. And I, I'll just give you a quick nod on this. One of the things that I do Um, I would say to pay it forward, not so much as a philanthropist, but one of the things that I do to pay things forward is I realize that especially people with my hue um, and grew up in my neighborhood, um, we have a tendency to end up in prison, take a bad path, et cetera. So I'm a very active participant in a thing called PEP, and it's Prison Entrepreneur Program. Mm-hmm. And I go in and I volunteer for that and I help them. And I have to tell you, I have learned from those inmates every time I go into the prison. They tell, they tell me some stuff that it just makes you think again, right? I, I mean, some of them, they don't go into all the reasons why they're falsely accused or what they're doing or how they do their time. Can I give you a quick? Please do, please do. So I have been going there a while. They always call me Mr. Ed, and I, I, I've, I, I've, I've been all right with that. Um, and we're, we're going there, and I had been there probably. I've been involved with it for about seven years. But this one brother came up to me. He said, "Mr. Ed," he goes, "How you doing?" Et cetera. Small talk. He said, "I'm probably not going to be here." the next time you come. And I said, tell me what's up. He goes, I am getting paroled out of here. I said, man, how long have you been here? He said, 20 years. I said, wow. And I said, "Um, so are you ready for the outside? He goes, can I tell you a quick story? He says, I was ready to get out of here five years ago. He goes, and when I went through the parole, they said, no. Um, and then I was the next year, they were ready to release me. And I prayed this prayer. I said, God, if I am ready to get out of here with the promise of never coming back, let me go. He goes, but if I am not capable of not coming in this door, keep me here. Teach me something. He goes, so they kept him another year. And he went through our program and he said, and one of the things we talked about, how do you become an authentic man? How do you become a a better husband, a better brother, a better son? 
how do you show up in the world moving forward? And as you shared, how do they bring forth that accountability to be successful? He says, and the good Lord saw that I needed a little bit more sharpening and kept me here another three years. He goes, and I am certain I'll never be back. And I'm saying, that's when you pray and you don't pray to get what you want, but you pray that God is going to help you get to where you need to be. So that's powerful. And and um, I think we all can apply that to our lives, right? We really can. We really we, can. And that, of course, everybody would think naturally, yeah, you'd be rushing to get out. Of course, you'd be rushing to get out. But that was wisdom on his part. That it really was, was to pray that. Um, and I think that's amazing. I think that's amazing that you do this program. And I didn't know I had no idea. So I love doing these interviews with people I know because I get to know so many more incredible things. Mm -hmm. I think that it's awesome. And I'm not surprised because I know you're giving heart. Um, and it's amazing too. Again, as a mother, and I'm a mother of a a, a black boy, <laughs> mm -hmm. I know the wow. importance of the work that you do. I know the the life saving, life changing implication of the of that work you do, but also mm -hmm. the work that you do as a speaker. So the the next part of so a success system is about calculating choices. Talk about some of the calculated choices that you've made along your journey. Calculated choices. Um, I, I guess I can throw a couple of them out here. Um, one of which was I made a choice, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, when I when I sold I sold my accounting practice. Well, first of all, making the choice to become an entrepreneur. I remember, and at the time I was married, I had two boys, and um, my wife, the the mother of my kids, basically felt. Um, that it was a crazy idea to start my own practice. Yet she agreed that we should not go to France. To France. <laughs> right, right. So I put in my notice before they made their move. So I got a little bit of a severance package and I, I'll never forget her. You mean, because you know, my checks would come direct deposit and go straight into the account. And she could do whatever she needed to do, knowing what days the checks are coming. She said, you mean those checks aren't going to be coming into that? I says, no, they kind of frowned upon um, giving money to people who ain't working for me anyway. <laughs> 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 but making that decision to start my business and the first six months working out of the house and then getting too much help for my, at that time, probably six and, and two-year-old. Um, it was like time to move it to an office and and continue to grow it that way. So first of all, making the decision to be the master of my own destiny by becoming an entrepreneur was really critical. Mm -hmm. um, so starting that, and, and when I started my accounting practice, it grew relatively rapidly. And um, because of which everything was going well. And I'll tell you something that's, you, you call it choices, but so here, here's a reality. When we run our own thing and we have even a little bit of success, we become very cocky. We think we have made it. I remember being 27, 28, thinking I had arrived. Not only did the company that I had, and by the way, I had bought a franchise. Okay. So I bought that franchise to do book work and accounting for small and medium-sized businesses. And in two years, they thought, wow, this guy's really jumping at it. I had a fine growth in clients and I had this expertise on taxes. They had me come be speakers on several occasions for their national thing in 27, 28. I thought I had it all going on. And it's like, there's nothing else for me to learn. What else should I do, right? And um, boy, did I find out that there is so much more to learn. <laughs> so much more to learn. <laughs> So making the making the and so I made a decision. Well, one of the things I loved doing was selling at that time. And so I went to a seminar where I really loved listening to this guy. His name was Walter Haley teaching us how to sell. It was interesting. He, he used this concept called near marketing and that's natural existing economic relationships. How do you build those to grow your business? So 
um, after about six months of that, it was like, man, I was addicted. I was so addicted that I wanted to do what he's doing. Oh, I love it. So I sold my accounting practice to the accountants who I had hired and started what I do today. Uh, since Dear, 19- talk a little bit about that. Well, since 1990, I've been helping other accounting firms and professional service firms with business development. How do they grow their business? Um, One, two, how do they grow leaders within their business? So I decided that that was a path that I wanted to take and start helping people do that. Because a typical accountant is not proficient at selling or being leaders. They're really, and I say they, I fall into that category. We're very much introverts. Mm-hmm. So if we're, you're an introvert, you don't want to be going knocking on doors saying, um, don't you need an accountant? And, and so it, but when you have a system, it overcomes a lot of those anticipated fears. So I, do, I bought a system in the franchise. I start working the, the franchise with my accounting. And then I said, okay, what systems can I put in place to start my own consulting company? That's awesome, and that is awesome. And you know, and I as an entrepreneur, because I made that scary choice. <laughs> it was scary. It's a um, scary choice, isn't it? Yes, and it's almost ten years ago. It was twenty thirteen uh, mm-hmm. that I made the scary choice to leave a very comfortable job uh, and become an entrepreneur. And you're exactly right in that we're all blessed in different ways. So we have our thing that we know, <laughs> mm-hmm. and our thing that we do as an entrepreneur. You got to know a little bit about everything or know it uh, know enough to hire other people to do right. things. So I think that it's awesome uh, that that you made that choice and that you're sharing that journey. Uh, I know somebody's going to be inspired. Well, I, I hope so. But it's kind of like you in 2013, when you made that choice that you're, you're jumping off a cliff without a parachute, really. And it's like, what can you do to make sure that you land properly? And that's developing systems, finding other people around you, and and continue to um, go towards what your goal is. And and, um, my hat's off to you on that. I appreciate Um, that. And I'm figuring things out and learning along the way and and honored uh, and blessed to be connected to to some amazing people like you. Like (laughs) you. (laughs) So, okay, Ed, you have proven Oh, do you want to say something else? I was going to say, can I share with you a big obstacle I had, though, when I made the transition to consulting? Please do. When I shifted to become a consultant, I, from 1990 to 94, I'm, I'm doing various firms, various accounting firms, big, small, and little, et cetera. And finally, I hit this one client. And rather than get into a long diatribe of what this is about, um, I landed Arthur Anderson as a client. Those of you are not familiar with the accounting industry, it was one of the big eight at the time, and they had 100,000 employees. And I I did a couple of programs for them. They loved it. And I got to where 90% of my revenue came from that firm. Oh, wow. Some years, even 95%, because they would hire me. I would do anywhere from 75 to 100 gigs for them all over the world. I've spoken in 44 countries, 25 of them was on behalf of Arthur Anderson. And then in 2001. I was like, where's the obstacle? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Huge obstacle. There was the encounter, most of us remember 9-11. The month after 9-11, which is October 2001, Anderson, Enron and the SEC realized that Anderson was or accused Anderson of not doing the financial work for Enron properly, which allowed Enron to um, Mm -hmm. falsify documents and for people to rely on those documents. And so Anderson got in trouble. And I wrote a separate program just for them to help deal with the PR nightmare they were about to encounter. And as I said, they, they rep, represented most of my business. By January, my entire calendar for 2002 was full. By April, I got a phone call from them 
and they said, we're going out of our going out of business. We're closing our doors. Everything else you have on your calendar for us, we're going to wipe off. Now, I will tell you, they said they had looked at an old contract and my contract said that anything that cancels within 30 days, they have to pay for. They paid for 42 days of training, but everything else went off my calendar. So my calendar went from full to almost non-existent. And it's like, you want to ask yourself, do I want to stay in this business? Or when I had them as a client, why didn't I get other others like that? And I had this loyalty thing that I was loyal to that large client. So I didn't want to talk to other large clients. However, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there all alone without any revenue, any business. And it's like, how do I restructure my business so that this never happens again? So I, I have this rule now. I never let one client be more than 15% of my revenue stream because at any time, and you, know, you would think I, I would have learned that lesson after Anderson. I did the same thing with HUD. HUD had, and I did it, just did it the second half of the year where they booked every week from like July through December on my calendar. And I just scheduled it and I was going and doing it. And after two months, their new budget did not get approved. So I had to erase it. And it's like, duh. Um, <laughs> like, this feels familiar. Uh, yeah, it's like, you should have learned something from that other lesson, right? <laughs> but I can so see I how it's it easy again. to do that, though. I can see that being an easy thing to do. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm available. That's the money. I will accept the business. I could exactly. Actually... Yeah, I mean, it was so, it was too easy. Um, so that you have to ask that question. Am I putting myself in a corner here for a mess up that's going to turn up my business? And um, that's exactly what I did. That's interesting. That's interesting. I have to talk to you a little bit more about how you uh, exactly how you navigate that now. Okay. Okay. So in this program, I have what I call the So a Success System. Like, again, you've shown you know how to overcome obstacles, eliminate excuses, and calculate choices. So you are so a success man. But Ed, what is your personal definition of success? You know, it's, I wish I could say that was a real short question. Um, I would start off by saying something I say often when I speak is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And it's like, what is your, what is your desire? What is your worthy ideal? as a human being or as a professional, or as a person. Mine goes back to what I had shared about my father. Um, he passed at a young age. Um, and when I had my three boys, my, my thing is to create magical moments for the people I love. And I do that today to create magical moments for what I call my, my circle of influence, my inner circle of influence. And it pertains to my significant other, my, my, five, my five kids, my three kids, my seven grandkids, um, their spouses, and anything in that group. I, I'm constantly looking for what can I do to create a magical moment for the people I love? Um, because life is too short. You don't know how long you're going to be here. So um, if I create those magical moments, I feel successful whether the money comes or not. I love it. I love it. I love it. And it's powerful. And I know um, creating those magical moments and the ripple effect that comes from that um, is powerful. And I, I'm super honored that I got to meet um your grandson. I seen, you know, I've seen some of the magical moments, and that might not even be part of what you define as the magical moments. But mm -hmm. I do know that you have taken the time to bring them to to influence and put them in the youth program. Um, and I just think that's awesome, um, awesome opportunities that you are providing to your children, or you provide to your children, you provide to your grandchildren. And I can only imagine what some of those other magical moments are. Um, oh. <laughs> I, I can I can I can share two things. Okay. One is magical moments is bringing them to NSA. When I say I'm a blessed man, 
I brought all three of my sons to the leadership program at NSA. And um, they went through there and had a great time. As a matter of fact, I got hired to do one of my first overseas events because my oldest son was a leader in there and took care of somebody else's kid who just so happened to be a speaker's bureau and asked me to come speak for her in New Zealand and Australia. And please bring all three of your sons. So she's had all three of us, I was the four of us at the time, we all went down and we spent two weeks um, for that gig. <laughs> now, fast forward, um, and my, my oldest son was 18 at that time. And now my oldest son has uh, a 20 year old and he has gone through that same training as well as um, become a leader in his life. And, um, I'm blessed. I mean, my kids are successful. Um, one's a director of sales. Another one's a director of marketing. Uh, one is a, a lawyer who's a chief marketing officer in charge of anti-money laundering for a financial institution in, in Charlotte. Um, they do great things. And um, more importantly, when I, I, I take them to dinner, they take the check. It's a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's when you know you've done something right, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what, yes, yes, yes. I think that's awesome. And I think back to your story of not having your father there um, and the impact and even, you know, probably some of the anger and things that you felt in middle school that led you to go to Catholic school, which mm -hmm. transformed a lot of things for you and how now you are changing the, or you have changed the trajectory of your 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 children's lives, your grandchildren's lives by being a man and being there. And, and, and I just think it's, it's powerful, powerful. And I hope more and more men are inspired by your story and step up and do the same thing. You gotta okay. be present in their lives. If you bring them in the world, you gotta be present in, in their lives. It changes everything. It changes everything. Okay, one last question for you. Okay. So you you dropped a lot, a lot of nuggets, um, given a lot of information, but what's one last piece of advice you would give someone who is watching this and they have their own obstacles, their own challenges in life, but they want to be successful too. What's one last piece of advice you would give? I guess it would be a, a variety of things. One, and it's hard to just boil it down to one. If I had to boil mine down to one, it, it's believing in Christ and making that an integral part of my life. And if, if you ask me my biggest failure, my biggest failure would be not having had success bringing all three of my kids back to the church. Mm. And I still think I'm trying to work towards that, but it has been my driving force. And I tell them they are successful because they have someone who loves them praying for their crazy monster butts every, <laughs> every day. And they are getting success because somebody has their back. And I know my grandmother prayed for my crazy butt every day. And uh, when you have that kind of a warriors um, praying for you, you can't help but succeed, but you have to stay on that path. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I agree. I agree 100%. I love it. I appreciate you, Ed. This was an honor. It was a privilege. I know it's going to change some lives. And I just, I thank you and I love you. And I look forward to seeing you next month when I'm in Houston. Yeah, I, you know what? I look forward to it too. I'm a, uh, we're going to go to dinner and one of those boys live here. Maybe we'll get some of those grandkids and we can just go out and have some, some food, Texas I style. <laughs> I'm all about the family. I'm all about the family. Thanks again, Ed. Yeah. Yeah. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me and continued success with this show. You are kicking butt, taking names. Keep it up. Following your footsteps. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>